Good afternoon, this is Gary Kavner here on TRSI. I'm here today with my friend and colleague, Michael Dwar. Michael, how have you been since we last talked? I've been tolerably well, Gary, yourself? Well, other than the fact that people keep trying to have gripped, shut down and removed from things, I've been pretty solid. Yeah, maybe you should look for different employment, Gary. That job out that you have having gripped, it, it doesn't look secure to me. And yet we remain, Michael. And yet you remain. And in fact, I imagine every time something like this happens, the subscriptions go up. They do. There's there's nothing quite like when you say, you know, we are antagonistic to government because we believe that they're not properly examined. And that they, you know, that enables them to do things that are not in the public interest. When people seen to be attached to the government come out and say that you should be banned. It's almost like it reinforces what you're saying is true. Being described as being antagonistic to the government for a, a media platform or a newspaper, online, electronic or in print, it would seem to me would be a good thing. That is what the people is looking for. Yes, but it's not what your staff are looking for when they want to take up those special advisor posts. This is also true. Special advisor posts, which pay a lot better than being a journalist. I was talking to a friend of mine who worked in local journalism for many, many years. And it's not just that journalists are, relatively speaking, not well paid. There have been real declines, not just sort of, adjusted for inflation declines, but what uh, a senior journalist in a local paper would have been getting, say, 20, 30 years ago, and what we're getting now, is significantly lower. And that's been that's also reflected, I, I, I think, at national level. So when, you, when these people, uh, these poor young people, see what you're getting, and then they see what you can get as a special government advisor or, or somebody you know, doing media for one of the big departments, yeah, I, you want to get a pension. You want to get a pension pot. You want to get earn a few quid. That's where the money is. Why? Why? Why make enemies unnecessarily anyway? One of the great lessons, Bertie. Never make an unnecessary enemy. Well, I mean, if you were in journalism and you want to go into a better field, as in a a field that will pay you more and might allow you to actually support your family, you really have two options. You have communications and PR, or you have working for government or you know a department basically interfacing with the government or helping the government do things effectively kind of hard to do those if the government hates you it's never stopped us michael yeah but i think the, the not not a great deal of hope that uh michael martin is going to wake up one morning and say bring me those nice boys from from the right side that's what we need to reinvigorate our messaging and pay them Pay them with peacocks and baboons and ivory because they are so deserving and they, their skills should be recompensed. A bit like, do you see Oliver Callan? This has nothing to do with anything, but I don't know if you saw the story. Oliver Callan apparently has got an hour long radio show on the, and it, for which he's getting 150,000 a year. I, I saw a lot of critique of that. And the only thing I will say here is this I don't know enough about the economics of radio to know if that makes sense. But it's fairly easy to work out how much advertising space a show sells. And I mean, if he brings in more than he costs, I don't really have a problem with that. I think it's it's fairly easy to work that out for radio. But you see, it's not, because you, you, you don't know. You have to first work out that if you put on a talking dog, well, no, actually, a talking dog would probably get a lot more because, let's face it, a talking dog would be interesting. You have to be able to distinguish between his particularity and just anything at all. Well, in this instance, you actually have the ability to do that because it was our dear departed friend's show and then he had to be gotten rid of and now they have sort of a liminal period and then you're going to bring on Callum. So you can tell if it doesn't go up when Callum comes in, well then, he's not worth it. I would also say with Callan, depending on like, what he's doing, it could be quite time-consuming to produce good comedic content. Which is not to say that the show will consist of good comedic content, but it might. It might. Hey, why would he? I, it might, Gary, but I think it's unlikely. I mean, why would he break a pattern now? And it, my point wasn't so much that he was being excessively paid but rather because let's face it you're only being paid for an hour but it ruins your day because you have to do the hour you have to go you, it's, my point was other i would be willing 
to sacrifice myself for an hour a day on radio for 150,000. That was simply my point. If anybody was listening and they thought, you know what, we'll put him on the radio for 150,000 an hour a day. I would be willing to do that. So how much do we have to pay you to get you back to doing this podcast two or three times a week? <laughs> more than you would be willing to, which I suspect is probably more than 25 quid. So just to, to start off, I just want to point out something to listeners, if they aren't aware. Uh, Kevin Myers has a piece in Grip today, hopefully as part of a regularly scheduled column. I believe this is the first time Myers has been featured in a an Irish media publication since he was chased off um, over his comments. That's a very broad, actually, description. <laughs> it's it all the things that Kevin has said. His comments. There were many options. Um, I have read the piece. It is very good. I'd actually forgotten how good of a writing, writer Kevin Myers is. And also that Myers is not a man who's ever heard the phrase, don't speak ill of the dead. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's on, uh, he wrote on the energy entrepreneur, Eddie O'Connor, who's been dead two weeks. Mm-hmm. Managed to get a reference to the Nazis in. But uh, it's a very well-written piece, it's, and hopefully it will be the first of many with Kevin, so I do recommend that you go and have a read of it. It is subscriber-only. I think all of his columns are likely going to be subscriber-only. We might open them after a couple of weeks or have the odd one that's free just so people can get a sense of it. But it's part of our project to provide more value to gripped subscribers, Michael. Very good. Lots of value. Hmm. And so I suppose that's the, the housekeeping. And one... Other thing just to mention at the start, Michael, because I don't think we say enough good things about the government or there's a lot of complaining when the government doesn't do things. So we should actually mention when they do something that could be good. I haven't looked at the full details of the scheme yet, but Mm -hmm. it seems positive. A couple of weeks ago, I asked Ben Scallon to ask uh, Michael McGrath and Pascal what was going to be done with the debts that had been warehoused by Revenue during COVID-19. During COVID-19, because basically the, the economy was you know non-existent, companies were allowed to defer repayment of some of their tax obligations. Because most companies, one of the most pressing problems for companies in Ireland is not that your business is fundamentally flawed, it's a problem with liquidity. So if the economy, let's say, Michael, just as a thought experiment, uh, ceased to operate for most of two years... Very few business could could have gotten through that without help. But now those debts are coming due and people have already repaid a lot of them. But we've talked before in the show that there was a concern, or I had a concern more explicitly, that firms had built up so much debt and were making so little profit that basically there was no way these guys were ever going to be viable before a me- you know, before they needed to make the full payments. And basically you would see the potential of a wave of collapses. And, and contagion as business after business kind of went under. And when Ben asked Pascal uh, McGrath, they got an answer that basically said, well, you know, that's the nature of, of business. Firms live, they die. And in, in, at the time, I thought, you know, that's in a normal economy, Michael. Yeah, that has to happen. Businesses need to fail and succeed. And there needs to be a what's called creative destruction. But this wasn't a normal operating system. So it seemed like a bit of a glib response because this was not something where a business had traded improperly or had simply been outcompeted. This was a government policy that shut down the economy. So it seems unfair to basically say, well, you're going to just have to deal with the negative consequences of that. And if you can't deal with it, well, goodbye. The Business Post is saying that the Department of Finance and Revenue, which is it's their department, are going to make revisions to it, allowing firms to defer repayments of it for another three to five years. And there's also talk of reducing the interest applied to the tax debts. So were that, that to happen, that would, I think, generally be a positive thing. I haven't seen the exact details of the scheme. This is just the, the business uh, post reporting that this is happening. Oh, I finally said business post as opposed to Sunday business post. Oh, it took two years of a rebranding. There you go. This could be a very good thing for, for keeping particularly small businesses um, from the wall. I would have thought if you're looking at the single biggest massive cost increase that you've seen in the hospitality industry, and not just the hospitality industry, but across the board, it's energy. I would have thought energy and wages. 
we, we know age, wages are a problem and the increase in the minimum wage for small businesses is going to be a problem. But we also know wages are a problem because there's bottlenecks in the market that if you talk to anybody in, in that particular industry, they will tell you that they're cons- constantly are struggling to find staff. But it just on, and I was looking at some figures there from, I think it's from the UK, uh, but it wouldn't be that that different in Ireland, that if you look at industrial and in, uh, industrial electricity prices trebled between 2004 and 2021 over a 17 year period, but they trebled. And then add in the 2022 energy crisis and industrial costs quadrupled. Now we know that uh, on at, at different points in the system, that there's a very large government component to that, but also government planning and government policy about electricity and generation and uh, energy use is a very large part of the cost base. And I think it, if I were that business, I'd be looking to the government to say, do something more sensible also in, in, in that. But there you go. I've noticed a lot, of, um, a lot of business people are saying that they're under pressure. And a lot of the time... The response I see from members of the public, particularly on social media, particularly from the left, is stuff like, well, if you can't pay your staff a fair wage, then you deserve to go bust. Or if you can't afford that, well, then you deserve to go bust and you know, someone else will come in and do it. And as someone who drives fairly regularly through the, should we say, Michael, the more disused towns of Ireland... Usually what happens is that no one else comes in to deal with it because if a business, like let's say a cafe, just becomes unviable due to costs, it's likely that all other businesses in that sector are also under the same pressures. Wages particularly, if you have a couple of staff, small increases in wages can become incredibly large. If you take a small number and multiply it enough times, you're going to be dealing with something significant. On one hand, it's understandable because most people are never going to manage a business or have to concern themselves with being the person responsible for ensuring that someone has a livelihood. But it seems incredibly blasé and I think just reflects a lack of understanding and probably respect for people who actually start businesses and run businesses, not multinationals, but like small local businesses that provide employment in those areas and keep people in those areas. I think there's deep lack of respect. I think a lack of understanding. There's, I, I think there's beyond that. I think there's a sector of Irish society that has an, an actual hostility. We both know that we've heard the reports of people going in from representing, say, small and medium-sized businesses. And the attitude coming back from revenue basically being, listen, we know you're all a bunch of tax-dodging cheats. And... I think that that's a, an element of that kind of attitude is to what, throughout a portion of our society that if you're in business, you can't be successful in business and be straight, that th- there's a certain left-wing perspective that sees the very nature of the employer-employee relationship as being exploitative. And unless the, you're paying your staff some kind of you know, fantastic level of salary, then the, the, you are you're screwing them. And there's absolutely no understanding of the nature of costs, none. And so, yeah, if you have a small, not very prosperous town somewhere in the Midlands and you have a cafe which has been ticking on for a few years and then it closes, well, then the chances that somebody else is going to come in and then endure all the startup costs and re- the costs associated with the re-establishing business, you open it up again and then go back, that, and they're going to be able to find a way of maintaining that business Without growing it, I mean, if they can find a way of growing it, well, then great. Then they probably have a chance. But if they, they're, why would why would you expect that they're going to find a way of making money when the people before it didn't? If there's if their cost base is the same and you have the startup costs on top of that, so the restartup costs. But there's no, I, I don't think there's any, there's any understanding of what it's like to run a business or any desire, no curiosity indeed. You know, if you're well ensconced in your semi-state or state body and you fail, you're, you're never going to get the sack. There's no sense that these people are in any sense wealth creators or that they have even a useful social function. SMEs employ over a million people in Ireland. I think it's the 2021 figures were something like 1.1 or 1.2 a million. 
the majority of people employed in the state, actually. And given, shall we say, some of the changes in our tax code, one would expect them to be an even more important sector moving forward. And yet we have revenue doing things like moving to uh, change the regulations surrounding the reporting of expenses in a move that kind of gives off a feeling of we really don't trust you and think you are bilking the system. And beyond that, we're just going to put another layer of bureaucracy in place. We don't seem to be moving towards a point where it's easy to run a business in Ireland. Like, I don't know if you've, if you've tried to open a business banking account, Michael, in the last number of years. Jesus Christ, it's awful. So, briefly, Malcolm Byrne. Yeah, briefly, Malcolm Byrne. That's briefly, a, Malcolm Byrne. The best of kind advice. of Malcolm Byrne. <laughs> yeah. Malcolm Byrne was in the uh, media committee during the week, I think either Wednesday or Thursday. Uh, the press council was in, along with a number of other people talking about the threats to the press. And Malcolm Byrne decided that he wanted to ask a very particular question about Gript with a very particular setup. He talked to the press council about one of the principles the press council has is that member publications shall not publish material intended or likely to cause grave offence or stir up hatred against an individual or group on the basis of you know, race, religion, nationality, colour, ethnic origin, that sort of stuff. And then he asks, straight away that prompts the question of how gripped media was permitted into the press council. I, and I think a great number of people, took the view that the presentation of that question was designed to put pressure on the press council about grip media's membership of the press council, as opposed to just being a general, you know, I was just wondering about this. And I mean, that would fit with Malcolm quite generally. And then I went on to say, in asking this question, I fully anticipate being targeted by grip media and some of its followers. However, it is an important question. I'm not sure it's targeting if you go on to a parliamentary committee which is broadcast <laughs> and attack someone if they then follow up it's sort of a uh, you know if you hit me I'll go to teacher and now I'm going to hit you first sir 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 he said horror sir he called me oh sir yeah I, I, I tell you well I think there are many things happening here first of all I think perhaps in a political party where Michal I suspect dislikes script uh, Malcolm has decided to become the attack Labrador of the party. Uh, well, one of the attack Labradors of the party. Secondly, Malcolm has recently announced that he is not going to seek to run in the European elections. You can decide whatever you want, how that means, whether or not he sought it, but was rebuffed. But whatever reason happened, it has happened. And he's going to seek election in the next general election, which but pro I, more and more, I think we're talking to people who think it's going to happen this year. Some are thinking September, some are thinking sort of end of October, November. But the, increasingly, there's a sense there's going to be a general election this year. And so enterprising young politicians who are going to be running in funny constituencies, particularly constituencies where there are going to be quite a few people who've never heard of them might want an opportunity to get their faces on the telly or on the internet or get their name bandied around because let's face it Gary a lot of the time the most important thing for a politician is to get your name out there because people don't necessarily remember why they heard your name they don't know if your name was was re was put out and published in a good sense or a bad sense the important thing is to get your name out there. So this is maybe an opportunity for Malcolm to get his name out there. Maybe he thinks that by pandering to a certain kind of constituency, he's more likely to get a few votes from his, or maybe get some transfers. Maybe this makes him more transfer friendly. I thought it was a nauseating thing to do. And I would be very curious to know, since obviously he must have done this on the basis of specific instances specific nasty for what he considered to be nasty distasteful instances if we could can we do an foi from the the press council to see the number of times that malcolm has complained uh, on and on what grounds to the press council for what stories the crypt ran because the press council has a a code of conduct has it not 
Or it does, and actually Malcolm highlighted quite an important issue. The provision that he's referring to, the idea that you cannot publish something which has the potential of causing grave offence, I think is is a provision that shouldn't be there. I think if you say that you're, what you're concerned about is truth and accuracy, well, that's a, that's a subjective question. There could be, you know, edge cases on opinion pieces or the like where someone can say, well, we don't believe it's accurate because we have a particular political view of certain things. But in most instances, you know, those are going to be statements of fact. They are what they are. Which means that both it's easy to rule on and it's easy to appeal and it's, re, you know, if you didn't like it, I suppose you could take a judicial challenge or something like that. Or sorry, judicial review. What Malcolm has highlighted is that that one is very easy to use. It's entirely subjective and it would be very easy to use that politically. And I, I don't suppose that was his point and I, I don't suppose it's going to change because it is what the press council has in place. But in a perfect world, Michael, it wouldn't be there. Yeah, I mean, it would seem to me that in the last number of years, if you're talking about stories giving offence large scale, I think there have been quite a number of stories that have given quite a degree of offence to, say, for example, traditional Catholics across Ireland. The, the, I think that in some of those stories, that what those stories contained were true and accurate accounts of things that happened, but I think they would have still caused considerable offence to uh, traditional practising Catholics. So I, I think it's an odd, an odd thing to uh, include for for an industry which is supposed to be based on truth seeking and truth telling to to make a offence one of the metrics or a principal metric of whether or not something should be acceptable or unacceptable is an odd thing. I don't like when organisations have values, Michael. I like when organisations have purposes. So I think the purpose of the press council should be to oversee certain things such as are, is truthful information being published and mm-hmm. you can sign on to it or you you know you don't sign on to it as you want when we start getting into the idea that well it's not about publishing true or untrue material or it's not about respecting the privacy of people or it's not about all of these things it's about values and sharing the values of the press council i think you're onto quite a dangerous area because the press council has quite a bit of influence over what member publications write now i think if you asked our um, our peers in the press council they might disagree with that because and they would say well you know this is just what we do anyway but if let's say you had a very political press ombudsman who started making decisions about how they were going to read let's say the gross offense part in relation to misgendering people Yes. That would likely actually have an influence on how the press is going to report things, which could be of interest in the upcoming referendum. So there are things the Press Council can do to uh, actually shape discourse. Also, again, if you talk about sharing values. I'm not sure if I want shared values if you're talking about a conglomeration of media outlets. I don't want them to have shared values. I want them to have different values and to express those different values in the way they go around doing their business. Well, then you may not like the press ombudsman response to that question, Michael. Susan McKee. Okay. We had, there were two people from the press council who were speaking. You had Rory Montgomery, who's the chair of the press council, and you had Susan McKee. Uh, people may remember Susan from her work on abortion. I do. Uh, Rory Montgomery pointed out that the constitution of the press council states that any publication that circulates in Ireland or part of it is entitled to be a member. And that is uh, laid out in the Defamation Act of 2009, which I believe was brought in by Malcolm Burns party. There's an explanation there. And, you know, he says there's obligations from being in the press council and there is a disciplinary procedure that can result in the expulsion of members, but that's never been done. He hopes it wouldn't be done. And there's just... A sort of, he says, you know, I don't want to get into individual cases. It's not for us to scrutinise how member publications are performing. He says that there need to be complaints and you know, yes. people can make complaints. Susan McKay takes a slightly different tone. She says that, uh, as Mr. Montgomery pointed out, no one can take membership of the press council for granted. That isn't really what Mr. Montgomery pointed out. 
No, no, it is not. It's just, if people do not share the values of the press council, that will emerge and they will not be able to remain members. This is all constantly under review with all members of the press council. Mm. Constantly under review? Organisations that are in the press council have to uphold these principles, which include decency, respect, and treating people properly. Hmm. Mm. Decency, respect, treating people properly. Sounds a bit... Well, it either means something or it means nothing, but either way, it's either it's dangerous or it's pointless. One or the other. She, she says something at the end that I'm actually curious of your take on. She says, some of those who define themselves as citizen journalists at the moment do not behave properly towards members of the public or towards journalists from the mainstream media. I hear frequently from journalists in our member publications who are being subjected to threats and bad behaviour at public events. That is not acceptable under the Code of Conduct of the Press Council. Now, she doesn't specifically reference Gript, and Gript, we wouldn't consider ourselves to be citizen journalists, but if you're not a signatory of the Press Code of Conduct, then it doesn't matter if something is acceptable. So who is she referring to? And if she is referring to us, I don't think that's doesn't relate to anything I've heard from the ground. I've never heard of a situation of one of our people behaving improperly towards either the public or towards other journalists. In fact, we we try and instill in our people that they should always be exceptionally polite and collegial to uh, other journalists. It sounds like that. What, it sounds like music more than anything else. That she's singing a song to give it. You, as a child, if I was watching a film with my with my parents and the music changed and something was happening in the story, there, I would often, I would inquire of my mother, why are they playing the sad music, Mammy? And this is what's happening here. She doesn't want to say something because maybe she, I suspect she can't back it up specifically, but she's, she's playing this, she's playing, if not the sad music, but she's playing the dangerous music. The worried music, the music that you play when you know, something is going wrong, something bad is happening. And it's a way of just, a, and I would say it's just, I don't know if you call it subliminal, but it's a way of adverting to, you know, there are good actors and there are bad actors and there are people who behave well and there are people who don't behave well. And I think the fact that she uses the, the, she uses the phrase citizen journalist, and it may be that may be that she thinks that in the perception of some people that they would make that kind of connection with that kind of journalism with the kind of journalism that Crypt does because it is an online platform rather than a print platform because it's shall we say it's an insurgency rather than part of the heritage media that there's a sense that this is in some sense connected to or similar to the citizen journalists and people will associate the two but it's a, it's it's music, it's poetry, and it's a way of creating a sense rather and with, without actually committing yourself to saying something clearly that you could be held responsible for. I I have perhaps an oversensitivity to the use of the phrase citizen journalist, even where it may not be being used to describe grip, because there are journalists in this country, you know, relatively prominent journalists, who refuse to refer to any of our staff as actual journalists partially because we're online and that is an object of less respect for them. Although that's kind of a a historical artifact at this point because so much of journalism is online. But partially because our members don't, or our staff don't tend to be members of the NUJ and we have particular editorial stances and we're a little bit fighty. Also, your readers are wrong. You have a bunch of very disreputable people reading it, Gary. And yeah, I don't think you should discount that. Anyway, Malcolm Byrne seemed to uh, seemed to enjoy the statement as he his only comment afterwards was, "I welcome that statement." Well, isn't that wonderful that Malcolm should welcome that statement? I'm sure we're all relieved that Malcolm is so welcoming about it. I did legitimately consider not touching on this at all, not because Malcolm said he expected to be attacked, because that's like a person on Twitter going, "If you block me, it shows I've won the conversation." You're like, "No, yes. if I block you, it's because you're tiresome and stupid." But actually for a simple reason, and this is going to sound like an insult, but it's not actually an insult, it's just a description. Malcolm Byrne is the second stupidest person in the Finnefall Parliamentary Party. Just dim, just not very bright. And so my initial reaction to this was not, oh, he said we're going to target him and therefore, you know, he wants this, because maybe he does. But it just kind of feels like kicking a not especially bright dog. Not that you should kick any dog, but this dog has a pitiful air about it. We want to be very clear about that. You should not kick dogs. You should not kick dogs. Dogs are people too. 
We like or dogs. Malcolm Byrne. Of course, Gary, you say that, and of course, immediately you know perfectly well all anybody's going to say is, who is the stupidest person in Green of All? By the way, I do not associate myself with Gary's comment that Malcolm is the second stupidest person in Fianna Fáil or the second least bright person. I'm, that's purely Gary's opinion. But I'm eager to know, and I'm sure he won't say it, but I'm definitely going to ask him the minute we stop recording, who, who is, in fact, the stupidest man in Fianna Fáil? And also, again, this is not designed to insult. This is just legitimately... That's not designed to insult. Well, I, I'm glad it's not designed to insult, Gary. Because it's not it designed would, to I, I would hate for you to, hate for you to say something which was actually designed okay. to right, insult. Michael, you know, there's, there's the other thing in Poland where if you if you ask someone what do you think is going to happen, they'll give you the wrong answer. But if you th- if you ask what do you think your neighbours think is going to happen, they'll give you an honest answer. So I ask this, Michael, not what what is your view on Malcolm Byrne. You were in Finnafal for a long while. You're in the same area as Malcolm. Have you ever talked to anyone who's worked with Malcolm Byrne and thinks Malcolm Byrne is smart? You know what? Uh, there are many people up around, around Gory that have a very high opinion of Malcolm. and uh, That's a wonderful answer to a question I didn't ask. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't know many people who've worked with Malcolm. Uh-huh. What was the general view of Malcolm's intellectual ability in the Finnafal common when you were growing up together. Oh, and Malcolm was a young boy. People regarded Malcolm as a very bright chap uh, when he was 14, whatever, 13. Uh, he was bright. I think he used to read in mass and read very well. Highly energetic, highly engaged. We disagreed about the opening of the skies. I was very I was very pro-Reagan's opening of the skies. Malcolm was, shall we say, more protectionist, more interventionist. And I would say that has tended to continue to be the case. Why did he think if we opened up the sky, everyone would just float off the planet? I think they no. I think he felt that the planes would fall from the sky and we'd all die. But again, not an insult, just something to know. <laughs> and I'm not saying he has less moral worth than anyone no, absolutely. else because of that's it. Yeah, absolutely. That's and very also, true. Very where true. I was saying that you you shouldn't kick Malcolm, that is both because you shouldn't kick politicians or people in general. But and you'll enjoy this, Michael. From Malcolm's we'll past, we know he can throw a punch. <laughs> I'm glad you edited this. He apologized for that. Anyway, uh, I hear that it's the rain is to continue for another couple of days, but then it's going to get cold again. That's the best you could do to just just gracefully move us off that topic. I can't believe you did that. We're not insinuating that Malcolm Byrne will return to his violent past at any point in the future. Or that he had a violent past apart from the incident we know about. I am going to meet this man probably on the street, possibly this morning on my way to get coffee. Do you have to do Oh, I mean, Michael, God. you probably should have put up a better defence when I said he was the second stupidest person in the party then. I don't know the party that well these days. <laughs> I really don't, you know? I like the way you don't want to lie, so you have to just keep trying to find very specific wordings. James Brown made a, a successful career as a barrister, so uh, James is probably quite bright. James Brown is an entirely different person. <laughs> but he's in the party. <laughs> Don't you have anything else you want to talk about? I mean, really? Uh, I, I, I don't think this is a fruitful line of discussion. I really... One thing I, I, I wanted to, to touch on, Michael, and I think I think this is something we've brought up on the show before, but I'm not actually sure if it is a concept we've gone into. And it, it's this, and it's a useful thing to know. People think about statements, particularly statements by politicians, as either being true or false, as being correct or incorrect. There is another way to consider them, and it's very useful, and that is the idea of something being directionally true or false, or directionally correct or incorrect. And you might think, what does that mean? What it means is this. It's very easy to lie to someone using truth, to deceive them, to make them think that something is the case where it is patently not the case. You can say something that is entirely truthful, but is directionally false, in that it is designed to make you think that something is happening. That is not happening. 
or to give you an improper view of the area because that is to the advantage of the politician or the speaker or anything, uh, anyone like that. Hillary Clinton, I think, is the er example of this. Hillary Clinton could stand there and give you a speech which is perfectly true, perfectly technically correct. She very rarely lied, other than saying like she was landing and ducking under gunfire, you know, the rare mistake. Yeah. But you would often walk out of it with absolutely the wrong idea about what was happening. And I think we should we should recognize that more. That skilled people can manipulate you using only true information by carefully selecting or presenting it, or even sometimes just saying something that they can say, oh, <laughs> no, I didn't mean for you to take it that way. And the reason I wanted to, to bring this up particularly is Grift has obviously been doing a lot of work on immigration uh, at the minute and how the government is dealing with asylum seekers uh, and things like that. And there were two things that came up that I thought really exemplified this, and I just wanted to highlight to people. When we have been going to politicians, and not just us, but media in general, have been going to politicians and asking them, you know, are these people being background checked? Are there criminal checks? All of that sort of thing. We have gotten responses that I think are most likely deliberately uh, intended to mislead. And the one part in particular I wanted to highlight is... There is a European database called Eurodac. Now, what Eurodac is, is it is a collection of fingerprints and some other information that can be used to manage asylum seekers. So if you have an asylum seeker comes into the country, you can feed their fingerprints into Eurodac and it will tell you how they applied for asylum in another country. Now, what happened when ministers were asked, you know, are there criminal background checks, is they would say, Fingerprints are checked against Eurodac, which will show if they have applied for asylum in another country. And then they would add, nearly every time, Eurodac also has a functionality that enables uh, Irish police to attempt to access criminal information. Basically to use it as a criminal background checking system. And that's been repeated a great deal. If you've been paying attention, I've no doubt you've heard it multiple times. And it's been reported as such. I decided I would go through Eurodac's annual reports from 2015, when they brought in the ability to uh, use it for uh, for criminal checks, to the end of 2022. And what I found is that between those two times, Irish police have never, not a single time, requested access to it on the grounds of criminality. Do you think, first of all, that they... Do they? Do the guards know that they can do this? And do the guards know how to do this? I mean, how difficult is it to do this? Thousands of these are put through every year. So I'm going to assume that it's fairly easy or can be done. Now, there are, there are limits to how it can be done. You need to meet certain criteria. But it can be done. And as far as we can see, up to the... Up to the end of 2022, the guards have never done this, ever. Between 2015 and 2022, 2015 is when this functionality became available, and 2022, this has never been done by the Irish guards. Not a single time. Not a single time, okay. No, no, and that is absolutely clear from this, zero every year. Ministers, I suspect, know this. You see, I disagree with you. I mean, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm not saying that I would discount the fact that they do know this. It's perfectly possible. I think they should know it. But on the basis of previous experience with previous different kinds of reports, I'm not willing to just immediately dismiss the fact that, first of all, the idea that they would ask the question, I think is a little bit optimistic about some of the ministers. I think that you're assuming a level of intellectual curiosity and that the question would occur to them. Genuinely, the question would occur to them. You might even say that beyond that, if they were actually with a functioning brain, they might say to themselves, but of course the guards have done that. If they can do it, of course they've done it. Why wouldn't they have done it? It's ridiculous to think that they wouldn't have done it. So maybe they just simply never bothered asking the question. Secondly, they're doing this on the basis of advice and information that they're going to be given by the permanent government. 
And that will depend, therefore, on the quality of the person giving the advice and the extent which they think it's necessary for the minister to know what the minister needs to know. Because if the minister doesn't know, I mean, going back to Sir Humphrey, and, yes, minister and all that, anybody who had to know how civil servants and politicians interact, that still is the important documentary on the subject. So, Gary, I accept, on the face of it, they should know, they ought to know, they probably do know, but I would not 100% discount the fact that there will be ministers out there who, for a variety of reasons, intellectual curiosity, lack of, an assumption that, of course, they bloody well must have done it, are working in the way that they, they don't know. So I, I, I would be curious to know what the answer was, but I wouldn't assume just 100% that they have to know. I'd also be, I mean, this, this is a question you can't possibly know the answer to, but why wouldn't the guards, in all of that time, why wouldn't the guards have made one inquiry? Does that not seem bizarre to you? I did. I checked it a number of times on that basis because you would have thought, you know, the new system has come in. Um, you want to see if it works. You want to, <laughs> you want to just get some handle on this. So I, I thought, I thought, you know, it could be that the numbers were low, but no, every year, nothing, zero. I just, that's to me weird. I mean, whatever with the politicians, and politics, politics, but that's a, that no guard thought, well, we should run that. How about running that through? Just like you say, if nothing else, we'll do it three times to see if it works. Or, I was an element of curiosity to see what kind of information comes back to you, just to see what the system is like. They wouldn't have bothered even once. Back in 2015, when the first system came online, they said, oh, that new thing has come online. Oh, let's try that out. But I suppose they, they use the system for its other purposes, as in they are feeding in uh, general fingerprints into it. Like it is being used for that purpose. It's just not being used for the criminal side of it. So, sorry, just go back, go back, just to rewind here for one moment. Sorry, Gary. This system exists because one of the things is to ask the question, have these people applied for asylum somewhere else within the system? Yeah? Well, what's the point? I mean, what, if that, if they, so they, they, what's the point in asking the question in that once, if they discover that somebody else has in fact applied for asylum, what difference does it make? To, to our knowledge, what difference has that made in practice to anybody applying for asylum in Ireland? So, Eurodac is a bit of an interesting one in that it was designed to help things like the Dublin Convention, which, yeah. for all intents and purposes, appears to be dead. Well, for all intents and purposes, we seem to have, a, shall we say, fairly significant disagreements within the government about what the Dublin Agreement actually calls for. We had recently, wasn't it, Leo talking about the myth of the, the first safe country? And then it turned out that many other ministers in the government actually believed what Leo believed to be a myth. It's unclear what impact Eurodac actually has. I mean, yes, you could have a system where someone is twigged as uh, being involved in, uh, you know, having some involvement in another country, and then you can put them back so that they can't attempt to claim asylum in multiple countries, having been refused. But it's, it's unclear the actual impact of it. And then there's another database which is called CIS. And CIS can actually be used for criminal checks, but it only contains alerts. So it doesn't tell you if someone has a criminal history. It tells you if there's basically an alert out for them at the, at the time you check. So there, there seems to be very little done in the way of actual criminal background checks, which I think is the problem here. No one wants to say, well, actually due to the restrictions placed upon us by some of the refugee conventions and due to our own practices, like we're not going to reach out to the Sudanese government and ask if someone has a criminal record because that requires notifying the Sudanese government that you know this person is trying to claim asylum. And with certain countries, that's just not something we want to do. Okay. So you can't criminally check someone you can't check their background you can't check if they're a good character if you cannot talk to the countries from which they've come with unless there is something they've done in europe that you can you can deal with so i don't see how you would actually 
with the restrictions we've placed upon ourselves, be able to do a, a comprehensive background check of these people. But I suppose the rebuttal to that, Michael, is all of those restrictions are ones we have placed upon ourselves. Yes. Without them, yes, we absolutely could. It's like Neil Richmond when he went on to uh, The Tonight Show and talked about our obligations. And John made the very important point, obligations under things that you have signed Ireland up to. Yes, and then when you point out, say, for example, because of the renegotiation, shall we say, post-Lisbon 1, uh, that so ourselves and the Danes have the opt-out on certain things. And the Danes have effectuated the opt-out. And then the, the obligation moves in the language, wasn't it? He said that what had been a legal obligation became a moral obligation. Well, the difference between a legal obligation and a moral obligation is one is legal and one is moral. And then moral is what you choose yourself. Byron, to the, the point at hand, I suspect they know that that system is not being checked out. So they're either they know and are attempting to deliberately mislead, or they don't know and they're incompetent. But I think the... I wanted to bring it up in relation to the eye of something being directionally false. Everything that is said when they talk about it is correct, but it is trying to bring you in the wrong direction, which is to say that there are stringent criminal checks and background checks applied to people who apply for asylum in this country. And that doesn't appear to be the case. It doesn't appear that that could be the case. There was one other example that I wanted to mention. It also relates to immigration, because I've seen a lot of it. NGOs coming out and saying that, you know, people say that you can just stay in the system for years and if you get rejected, you can just apply again and you go through this endless cycle of appeals. What you can actually do is you can apply and then appeal and then you have to go. And that, again, is deeply misleading. It's They've been saying it for years. Now, over the last while, it's become more true because of changes in the system. But historically in Ireland, what happened is, yes, you could only apply and appeal once. But you could apply for refugee status, subsidiary protection, and permission to remain separate times. So you you could get refused for one and then apply, and technically it's for something else. And they knew this, but they were telling you, like, no, no, you apply and, you know, you appeal. And didn't mention, yeah, but you can do that to multiple different things at once, or, you know, one after the other. And in the last while, we have changed to where all of them are considered at the same time. Now, that has legitimately speeded things up. But for years, the NGOs were telling thing, people something on it, which I think, again, was designed to be misleading. In the same way they use refugee instead of asylum applicant or, you know, asylum seeker or something like that. A refugee is someone who has found, who is accepted to require asylum. It is not everyone who comes to the country to apply for it. Anyway, that is my daily rant about uh, truth. <laughs> Truth, what is that, said Pilot, and he did not wait for an answer. Oftentimes you ask a question like that, the safest bet is to get out of the building. So on that uh, on that cheery note, I think we will close for the day, Michael. Yeah, and I, I should go and uh, put on my galoshes and get myself some coffee. Uh, we shall be back on Sunday, all being well. All the best. <laughs>